Hey, how's it going guys? It's Nate here. And Skyrim is a region home to all sorts of people who seek to defeat the Dragonborn. From the lowliest of petty bandits to literal evil gods, it seems everywhere we look in the Elder Scrolls V, there's another baddie who'd like to rip our head off. However, amongst all these villains are a handful of unique, particularly powerful evildoers who were meant to face at the end of certain dungeons and quests. These bosses are supposed to represent special challenges to the Dovahkin, and be more than a mere annoyance, and some boast rather fascinating backgrounds or characteristics that make them especially stand out. So today we'll be taking a look at five more of the greatest bosses and their battles in The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. Starting off, we're heading on out to Felglow Keep, an old fort on the northeastern border of the Whiterun Hold where we can meet a particularly cunning, evil Altmer mage, known as The Caller, and her small faction of followers, who call themselves The Summoners. As we learn during the College of Winterhold questline, The Caller and most of her Summoners that she's currently leading were all once attendees and professors at the college itself. However, following what the university's chief librarian, Urag Groshub, calls a quote-unquote difference of opinion with the Archmage, they all left the guild and set up shop here at Felglow. Basically, these mages were really interested in Daedra worship, necromancy, and using human subjects. All things Winterhold considered just a little too unethical. Nonetheless, after the summoners broke away from the college, the Archmage, and indeed most of the university's leadership, was actually content to leave them be. Sure, they knew the summoners were probably murdering innocent people to death and preparing to raise an army of zombies or something, but that wasn't really their problem. Alas, recently a student stole a whole bunch of books from their library and set off to join the evildoers at Felglow Keep. So now the college has to act. They need those books back. And who better to send than the Dovahkin to recover them? We'll have to head on out to the old fort, where we'll find the evil necromancers engaged in a whole host of horrifying experiments, defeat them, and as we make our way to the castle's final room, we'll find the leader of this whole cabal, the caller herself, in the middle of some dark ritual we're interrupting. She'll quickly stop what she's doing and address the player, in a shockingly cordial and polite tone. The ensuing dialogue will, in fact, offer you the opportunity to just ask for the books you're after back. Usually she'll decline, and the biggest battle of this quest will ensue. In combat, the caller has a tendency to summon multiple Atronox, use shock spells, and teleport a lot. So, if you're anything like me, be ready to get very annoyed. That all said, notice how I said... Usually, she will refuse to give you the books and a fight will ensue. Usually, as in, not always. You see, players with a high speech skill will hilariously, believe it or not, be able to convince the caller to just give it up and hand over what you're asking for without a fight at all. So long as you prove persuasive enough, you can navigate this quest without a final boss battle allowing you to complete the mission, and the caller will remain totally passive. Furthermore, it is also possible to find the college student who stole the books in the first place, imprisoned in one of the summoner's cages. Evidently, despite stealing them a bunch of books, they still didn't let the poor kid join anyway. If you free him and he's with you when you meet the caller, you can offer to give him back in exchange for the books, to which the elf will always agree. It's her seemingly inappropriately polite demeanor and willingness to negotiate that make the caller, this minor faction leader, such a memorable character. One could only wish all of Skyrim's other villains were so diplomatic. Next on our list, dragons are a pretty familiar foe to anyone who spent more than a couple of hours traversing the northern lands of Skyrim. However, there's one Dova that's hard not to specifically remember. The Skeletal Dragon. This undead beast can be encountered in the Labyrinthian, an old Nordic ruin that thousands of years ago was once at the center of a bustling city. In fact, the capital of an organization called the Dragon Cult. But now, all this time later, is little more than some Draugr and skeleton-occupied tunnels. 
Within one of the dungeon's first chambers, we can encounter this great calcified creature as it emerges from a tomb, evidently having been resurrected by the dragon priest Morokai. The skeletal dragon is unique in quite a variety of ways. For one, it's incapable of flying, likely due to the fact that it doesn't have actual wings. And a look in Skyrim's creation kit does indeed reveal that Bethesda gave this NPC custom scripts to prevent it from taking to the skies. Furthermore, while your battle with this Dova shouldn't be that different from any other dragon showdown, it uses shouts, levels with the player, and will even bite at you too, it will not give the player a dragon soul when killed, likely due to the fact that it's been resurrected by a long-alive necromantic dragon priest, Morokai again, rather than, say, Alduin. Interestingly, due to the fact that he, or she, hasn't been brought up by Alduin, the skeleton dragon is indeed the only Dova in the game that can be faced off against before the Dragonborn completes the quest Dragon Rising at the beginning of the quest line. In terms of the actual battle, as mentioned, he's not all that different from his soul-filled counterparts. And the real draw of this engagement isn't really the challenge of the battle itself, but the novelty from the fact that you're fighting a bony dragon a thousand feet below the ground. In fact, due to its inability to fly and just massive nature, cheesing the dragon with a bow and arrow is ridiculously easy, even at the lowest of levels. But what are you waiting for? Go put this bucket of bolts out of its misery. Coming in at number three, meet Draskua. She's one of a handful of antagonists we'll encounter during the Daedric quest, Pieces of the Past. Pieces of the Past centers around the player's efforts to recover the various pieces of a legendary Daedric artifact known as Maroon's Razor. We need them for Silas Vesuvius, a somewhat deranged Imperial living in Dawnstar, who recently just opened up a museum in his home dedicated to the god and his order of followers. And Silas really wants that razor. There are three pieces of it scattered across Skyrim for us to uncover. But I'm specifically interested in the Pommel, which is held by Draskua, an evil hagraven dug in at Dead Crone Rock in the Reach, alongside a small tribe of Forsworn. Just head on over there, dispatch the Forsworn subservants, defeat Draskua, and take the Pommel from her body to complete this part of the quest. It's not really all that notable. Heck, the Hagraven doesn't even put up much of a better fight than most of her feathery contemporaries. However, what I find so interesting is Draskua's backstory. In Skyrim, there's a book called Keepers of the Razor. It can be found in Silas's own house or purchased from merchants. It provides an in-depth account of what happened to the Razor of Maroon's Dagon and the individuals holding onto it so far. For those of you who are unaware, Maroon's Dagon, the Daedric God of Destruction, was also the principal antagonist of the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion. He and his cult of followers, who called themselves the Mythic Dawn, managed to assassinate Emperor Uriel Septim, the Dragonborn Emperor. Doing so resulted in Tamriel losing its protection from Akatosh, and allowing Maroon's Dagon and his army of Daedra to invade from Oblivion. This, for obvious reasons, was a problem. Lucky us, turns out in Tez 4, the Emperor had a secret kid before he died, who was able to stop the whole thing at the climax of the game. I know, wonderful story. Well, after all this ended, a militia of renegades formed, militants who went around hunting down former followers of Maroon's Dagon. And in the process, they came across his special razor. Realizing the artifact belonged to the Daedric God himself, they decided they could not allow it to fall into the wrong hands. So, they broke it up into three pieces, and gave those three pieces to their highest ranking members. The three members who received a piece of the razor were then instructed to pass down their piece to their kid, and have their kid pass down that piece to their kid, etc, etc, etc. The idea was to make sure it could never be reassembled ever again. And as it turns out, Dracula, this Hagraven, descends from one of those three. Specifically, a Breton woman from Markarth named Sorcha. Evidently, she's Sorcha's great, 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 great granddaughter. And interestingly, Dracula is apparently from Markarth too. We don't know a whole lot, 
But Keepers of the Razor claims that she fled the city to Dead Crone Rock following the Markarth incident. Again, some more history here, but for those of you who don't know, a couple of decades prior to the events of Skyrim, during the Empire's Great War with the Aldermary Dominion, for a very, very brief period of time, the Forsworn successfully captured Markarth. And they were able to successfully rule pretty much the entirety of the Reach as its own little independent kingdom. At least, they did for two years until the Great War ended and Ulfric Stormcloak himself was appointed the head of an army which marched on Markarth and retook the city. It's said that Ulfric was an especially ruthless commander, and after recapturing Markarth, he put innumerable men, women, and children to the sword, all for suspected Forsworn sympathies. At least, that's how the story goes. Whether or not you believe those tales are up to you. Regardless, the ensuing massacre that may or may not have happened is what we refer to as the Markarth Incident. Draskua, and evidently many of her ancestors before her, apparently lived in the city of Markarth up until that incident, after which she of course fled to her current location at Dead Crone Rock. Now, this woman is of course a hag raven. She looks like a monster, which begs the question, was she running around Markarth looking like this up until Ulfric kicked her out? Was she going to the market with these sharp claws and feathers coming out of her back? Or did she used to be a more normal person who transitioned into this form? It's all kind of confusing. Maybe this belongs in a mysteries video. I don't know. Whatever the case, Dracula is certainly a very, very interesting character to be a minor antagonist. For fourth spot, it's off to the ruins of Runevold where we can find yet another dark arts embracing Ultmer. I give you Minorn, a high elf conjurer who plays a particularly significant role during the Dawnguard DLC quest, Bolstering the Ranks. You see, shortly before the events of Dawnguard kicked off, apparently a large group of Vigilants of Stendar were excavating the ruins of Runevold, searching for various ancient artifacts and magical energies. But, as a variety of left-behind journals reveal, it wasn't long before something began to go wrong on their little adventure. A note reveals that members mysteriously stopped reporting back from the ruin. Like, the team here just stopped communicating with the rest of the vigilance. And when one man went on his own to figure out what was going on, he saw the men walking around with a strange look in their eyes, refusing to leave. This is pretty bad news for the Dawn Guard. They went to recover a certain Florentius Bantius, an Imperial Vigilant who was allegedly last seen as a part of that excavation team, and bring him back to their castle for questioning. Apparently, he has a weird connection to the god Arche, but that's neither here nor there. We'll be sent to the ruins to figure out what's going on, and hopefully bring Florentius back. When we arrive, we'll find those missing Vigilants alright, but they'll all be hostile and seemingly under the effects of a strange spell. Long story short, they've all fallen under the influence of the evil conjurer, Minorn, who has quote-unquote, charmed them. Basically, they're all being mind-controlled, and forced by her into becoming this elf's slaves. When we arrive, we'll have to cut our way through an onslaught of these poor charmed vigilants, and put an end to this deranged woman's scheme when we face down with her at the bottom of the dungeon. The battle itself shouldn't be all that difficult. She's basically just a high-level mage who really, really likes elemental spells. And I guess it is a little annoying, because in the midst of it you will have Charmed Vigilance rushing you as you try and defeat this woman, but doing so shouldn't be all that difficult. And once you do overpower her, you'll notice as all of the Charmed Vigilance that are still alive will randomly die. All except for Florentius, who can be found in a nearby chamber, evidently now free of the curse, and he can be led back to Fort Dawnguard to complete the quest. Additionally, after defeating Minorn, we can loot a unique staff off of her body, the Staff of Runevald, which calms opponents up to level 8 for 30 seconds, causing them to briefly turn passive. Frankly, capping at level 8 makes it a pretty poor item, but it seems Bethesda's suggesting that this is the staff Benorn used to charm all those poor vigilants. So, it's nice we're able to confiscate this item, and make sure that it falls into 
more responsible hands. And finally, last on our list, we have a bit of a two for one. Yep, it's actually six bosses rather than five. I know, I clickbaited you. But, as you can probably already tell by the B-roll on screen now, we're heading on out to the Forgotten Vale. A mysterious valley and glacial region on Skyrim's northern border with High Rock. It's said this place was once home to one of the last surviving enclaves of Snow Elves following the Nordic conquest of their homeland thousands of years ago. Here, once we've entered the main valley itself, we can come across a serene frozen lake, where, sitting on an island, lies a word wall. A very tempting prospect indeed. However, and I'm sure many of you already know exactly where we're going with this one, as we approach the Stone of Ancient Knowledge, two dragons will suddenly emerge from beneath the ice. This is our introduction to Volslarum and Naslarum. Two unique revered dragons, who are out to offer the Dovahkin the surprise battle of a lifetime. Unlike, really, all of the other characters we've covered thus far, your engagement with these two children of Akatosh should be anything but easy. I mean, facing off against one revered dragon is enough of an annoyance, but compounding the problem with two of them, who will each have somewhere between 900 and 3000 plus points of HP, depending on your level, is one way to quickly get me questioning just how many health potions I still have in my inventory. It gets a whole lot worse though, because similar to that skeletal dragon we covered so much earlier in the video, both dragons have a handful of unique scripts attached to their AI packages. But unlike the skeletal dragon, whose scripts kept it from flying, these ones have scripts that keep them from landing on the ice. Now, dragons that don't land are, well, pretty bloody irritating if I do say so myself. I hope you're good at archery or aiming with flame slash ice magic spells, because otherwise you are in for quite the problem. Strangely, we don't really know much about the backgrounds of these winged beasts. Their names, Voslarum and Naslarum, are both two of the only untranslatable dragon names in the game. Most Dovas have a name in dragon tongue that translates to some normal English word or term. Mermelnir, that first dragon we ever meet, means allegiance, strong, hunt. Odaving, the Dovakin that switches sides and takes us to Alduin's hideout at Skoldafin, his name means Snow, Hunter, Wing. You get the idea. No one knows what Voslarum and Naslarum are, though. Also, how long have they been below this ice for? Have these dragons been hiding out in the Forgotten Vale since the collapse of dragon rule over Skyrim way back in the Marethic era? Were they somehow resurrected by Alduin more recently? We may never know. No matter, this questionable past, the unique challenge they offer, and their amazing entrance easily make Volslarum and Naslarum two very unforgettable foes. And with that, we are going to wrap up. Five more of the most memorable bosses in The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim Part 2. Thanks for watching, everybody. Which of these various creatures and nefarious baddies did you personally identify as the most memorable? And what evil, twisted bosses did I miss? Leave a comment down below. As always, like ratings are very much appreciated. Again, thanks for watching, and I hope to catch you all in my next video. Peace out, everyone.